for the Famicom by Takuma Shoten and Atlas, released in 1986, or 87 if you prefer, based on the late Jim Henson and George Lucas spectacle bearing the same name. Prior to starting this diatribe, yes, I've seen the film myself on numerous occasions, despite being born less than two years after it was released. Hell, I even have the 99 Columbia TriStar VHS reissue. Also, unlike the Commodore 64 and Apple II computer adaptations by LucasArts and Activision that we were stuck with particularly during the time when the film was all the rage, it's pretty much obvious why this specific adaptation never bothered to see a physical release overseas. As always, since the entire game's in Japanese, just like with Wild Wild World 1 and 2 by Konami, Samurai Pizza Cats by Tecmo, and Akira by Taito, I'll be incorporating the usual T3 initiative, but then again there's that free translation patch by Inverse and Ataru from the short-lived Suicidal Translations, available at romhacking.net, whose link will be available in the credits and in other participating areas and or sources following this review. So without further ado, onward and upward to the Goblin City and beyond! Would you look at that? Short, sweet, and straight to the point. Hell, you even got the fucking opening score by Trevor Jones. Minus Bowie's Underground, of course. Drilling aside, if you've seen the film by now, the central plot should be at the very least second nature, as ever, God help me if I meet someone who hasn't. The synopsis revolves around a 15-year-old LARPer and aspiring actress with an active imagination, namely Sarah Williams, portrayed by a very young Jennifer Connelly, long before career opportunities, The Rocketeer, Higher Learning, Requiem for a Dream, Shelter, must I go on any further? Rehearsing her play in the park alongside her pet Merlin, easily distracted by a storm, not to mention a hard-to-remember line, they rush back home only to be scolded by her stepmom Irene and her biological dad Robert, if only the former, portrayed by Shelley Thompson and the late Chris Malcolm, respectively, in terms of Sarah's timing, and of course, their request to babysit their little half-brother Toby, portrayed by who could have guessed puppeteer Toby Froud, son of the British conceptual designer for the film Brian Froud, also of Dark Crystal fame. Yeah, Henson for the win, right? Much to her annoyance and frustration, Sarah's toy bear Lancelot's been stolen. Hence, according to her lifelong theatrical memoirs, she manages to make her wish come true in having the estranged tot shanghaied by none other than the wicked goblin King Jareth, portrayed by, <laughs> isn't it obvious, the late great Ziggy Stardust, Major Tom, Sound and Vision himself, David fucking Bowie. The two finally confront each other upon Sarah's discovery of Toby's unforeseen, instantaneous disappearance, and instead of returning the infant, not only does Jareth request that she'd forget all about him and succumb to his expectations and wishes, he offers Sarah a challenge. She's given 13 hours, 13 goddamn hours, to solve his massive topsy-turvy titular map, or her precious Toby becomes one of his kind for all eternity. Such a pity, right? <laughs> As far as gameplay is concerned, it's a top view adventure and RPG romp, much unlike the other adaptations I threw out earlier, aka what I like to call the bastard child of Zelda and Gauntlet. Upon starting, Jareth lays down all the deets and Sarah's out to fulfill her ultimate goal. The timer at the top right also serves as Sarah's health. Aside from naturally taking down second after second, more time gets deducted every time her ass gets dogpiled. She had her hand in Nightmare on Elm Street much? 
The assortment of adversaries and threats that she confronts include those infernal fairies, yes, the same one Hoggle rubs out after taking a piss, and various goblin creatures, diminutive and colossal alike, whether they're from the film or created especially for this game adaptation alone. While some take a single stone to wipe out, others take a hell of a lot more, and trust me, the latter will overwhelm your senses worse than even Toby himself. Upon obtaining a heart, you can actually donate one to one of Sarah's three companions, the latter two of which, according to the film, don't appear until later, despite being available from the get-go. The aforementioned Hoggle, alongside Ludo and Sir Dynamis. By the way, the characters are puppeteered in the film by Sherry Weiser and Brian Henson, with the latter providing the voice of the former character, Rob Mills and Ron Muick, with the latter providing the voice of the penultimates, and finally the three Daves, Goals, yeah, Mr. Gonzo himself, Barkley, and the voice of Shaughnessy, respectively. That aside, your rudimentary controls consist of your D-pad, used to make Sarah stroll around, north, south, east, or west, once again like Zelda in Gauntlet. Start and Select brings up a menu with her items, currency, and the health status of your companions, and pauses the game along with the music, respectively. B cancels any menu or dialogue box, and alts your companion when summoned, if nothing else, and A makes Sarah hurl stones towards her adversaries, and later various other projectiles, in tandem with the D-pad diagonally, I might add. As for the other items, lipsticks, clocks, and labyrinth books are used for adding more time to Sarah's lifespan and duration, 1, 3, and 5 hours respectively, with the latter being available for purchase from the worm, all of which are imperative necessities for survival, and even bracelets and jewels for extra currency, in the form of crystal gems, of course. Take note, the time bonuses can only be used with the unexceeded 13-minute limit in tow. Speaking of the supporting characters, you first meet the worm, performed by Karen Pearl of Fraggle Rock fame, and voiced by the late Timothy Bateson, at the beginning upon entering the introductory wall portion of the labyrinth via the door, at which point you're given 10 extra crystal gems for currency, and later the wise man in the hedge maze, performed by the legendary Frank Oz, and voiced by the late Michael Hordern, at which point you're informed of your progress thus far, as well as receive other vital necessities. He'll tell you how many key fragments that you've managed to find. To be precise, you'll need 12 of them in order to enter Jareth's castle, along with the magic stone to fuse together said fragments, selling you more time, specifically 1 hour aka minutes, worth 20 gems, as well as suitable items for augmented attack and defense, after racking up 3 coins in a specific region, likewise with the worm, and even remind you which direction to go, which for the record is not only indicated by a number and direction, but also randomized. Akira, anyone? In order to return to the Wise Man at any time, simply use Jared's that kind of crystal orb for warping, which for the record are also available for purchase. Shifting gears right back into the itinerary, not only do we see Sarah exploring both the Brick Road and the earlier recounted hedge maze, not to mention the forest of depression, laughter, and bewilderment, and don't even get me goddamn started at all with the infamous Bog of Eternal motherfucking Sench. Other areas include the Pavement Puzzle, the Garden of Evil, the Maze of Terror, and finally the iconic Ballroom, Junkyard, and Goblin City scenes, all leading up to Jared's Inner Sanctum, minus the Eshare Tribute, of course. Within each region, as mentioned previously, you're tasked with not only fending off every relentless-ass foe, but also seeking out and procuring those vital, aforementioned Labyrinth Key Fragments and Magic Stone, in tandem with the earlier recounted goodies. There's also these oubliettes you'll end up falling into, once again like its source material, minus the talking rock faces, aka false alarms, predating even Nick's Legends of the Hidden Temple by several years. Speaking of which, Olmec, meet your new roommates, that you'll have to chew your way out of, while attempting to meet said myriad of objectives. As you progress further and further, Jareth will randomly pop up, thus draining your time rapidly by the numbers, in which case I'd haul serious ass if I were you, and most importantly, have at least one or two Labyrinth books on hand. Consider that one of many infuriating factors to take into account, in addition to the aforementioned enemy confrontations that occur quite goddamn frequently, not to mention the central limelight of our usual next field of reference. As askew and derelict as the controls can be, mostly in terms of Sarah's movements, combat attrition, and post-damage recovery approaches, they're far from a pain in the genitals to get accustomed to, and the gameplay routine is nothing short of tractable, notwithstanding its infuriating gimmicks. Considering Labyrinth's challenge, in addition to what I've established thus far, you'll be spending the majority of your time balancing the two aforementioned key objectives, but make no mistake, this game will chop off your tallywhacker, have it fricasseed in Ferengi pubic hair, and finally fed to and spat out by Gigan, Gals from Gamera, Gizora, Mogera, and Ed 209 in one non-stop succession. Getting back to the enemy confrontations, every time you endure any amount of damage, while tirelessly exerting yourself to keep the nefarious piss and goblin fuckwads at bay, Sarah becomes temporarily immobilized, thus leaving her sweet ass open to endless gang rape after gang rape after gang rape. Oh, did I forget to mention AFTER GANG RAPE?! Should your lifespan timer happen to reach zero, it's an instant game over, for sure. And by this point, if you are expecting any continues, passwords, or save files, consider yourself piss out of luck, cause none of the above are available here, oh fuck no. Bear in mind every hint I've thrown out thus far regarding the gameplay formula, and oh, how could I possibly forget the goddamn partner system? Speaking of which, upon summoning one of your three companions via the music box, also available for purchase from the worm, along with having at least three pre-donated hearts per character, as mentioned previously, you'll notice right away that they all have contrasting speed and attack attributes. For example, Hoggle's a total pussy due to his shitty attack response timing, despite his well-balanced speed. Ludo barely attacks at all and is very goddamn slow, thus reducing himself to nothing more or less than a human shield, or in this case a monster shield. 
Sir Didymus, however, minus Ambrosius, is one tough badass of a Terrier Fox hybrid, carrying out his backup strikes in sync with Theris' attacks more effectively than the others, notwithstanding his glaringly fast speed, though not as fast as Speedy Gonzales or Sonic, god forbid, in which case he must be periodically halted every step along the way. All in all, useless as they are often deemed to be, they're rather beneficial for making your habitual confrontations all the easier, in tandem with the aforementioned increased defense and attack items from the Wise Man, namely the Ring and Staff. Graphically, for a mid to late 80s Famicom game based on such a well recognized cult fantasy slash musical hybrid of a classic, as washed out as the top few structures are, they're not too shabby in the least. In fact, they definitely capture the adventurous tone and feel of its source material. As for the in game avatars, Sir looks next to Diddly Fuck Nothing like her film counterpart, Jareth looks almost identical, if not accurate, both on ground and in close up profile form in the dialogue boxes, and every supporting and opposing character definitely match their respective source material equivalents, most notably the Worm and the Wise Man. All in all, in spite of the hodgepodge, out of place using and graphical limitations, decent presentation is decent. Musically, along with the sound effects, composed by Tsukasa Masuko for Atlas, each and every piece featured is spot on, if not accurately pitch and speed wise, lifted directly from Trevor Jones' original film scores and especially Bowie's original hits, mixed with original game exclusive compositions. Each piece is quite unique and definitely do its source material justice, alongside with the mishmashy visuals, though there are others that overstay their TV commercial brief welcome. The sound effects are pretty much on the same boat, but can get a hell of a lot more annoying down the road by comparison, in which case, yep, you guessed it, look in the other godforsaken way here. Well, in total frankness, there's barely any replay value at all, even after countless survival attempts, as long as you're able to get around every nerve wracking pit stop that this game will offer, and even its inhuman dick headed difficulty spike, you'll be desiring nothing more or else, through dangers untold and hardships unnumbered, to topple this brutal challenge time and again in more ways than you think, just to finally prove that your will is as strong as that of this game, and your fan base is as great. Labyrinth has absolutely no power over you whatsoever. Or does it? Therefore, my final verdict on Labyrinth, as I always share with each import game I dissect, it's much more of a cinch than anything to see why, once again, this particular adaptation never bothered to see a physical release universally like its source material. Anyways, if you're a diehard Labyrinth fan, or still are even today, or anything to do with the late Henson and or fantasy flicks, by all means, scope it out like a distant island lighthouse. And just like with the Ghosts and Goblins franchise, as overwhelming as this game can get the first few to several attempts, eventually you'll get the hang of its vital learning curve over time, and take note of the warning shown here. At various online auctions, Labyrinth for the Famicom should run you approximately a range of 8 to 60 bucks loose or complete and boxed. And must I mention that you'll be far from disappointed? Until then, kids, this is the Hardcore Retro God proudly signing the hell off.